I'm going to start by saying I'm not big into conspiracies. While I know there's a lot of secrecy and sketchy going on out there, I've always held on to the belief that most things should be taken face value and not everything is as shady as some people tended to believe. However, what happened to me three months ago has never been discussed since on any news reports, police files, or even gossip around the town, as if everyone decided what happened didn't, but it did. I've decided to write this and upload it here on the deep web so it doesn't get suppressed immediately by whomever doesn't want this out and hopes it won't reach the surface for everyone to hear and it won't be impossible to race. My name is Travis, I'm 19 and I live in a small town about 20 miles north of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We have a smaller population of 3,000, which is big enough. Not everyone knows, but if you tip back a few many two bottles of moonshine and ride your prized cow into town and you declare love of your relationship with Twinkies, the entire city will be gossiping by the morning. Sorry, Uncle Ken, that's now on the internet too. Most people in town will take 20 mile trek south for work in the big city, but not me. I've always worked on my family's wheat farm ever since I was little. It's the only job I've ever known. I know my father's plan was for me to take over operations of the farm when he retires and to support him in his final days. This may be selfish, but at the age of 16, I knew that this wasn't for me. The only freedom I received from the monotony is when I had a transport harvesting grain to any cities that were nearby. I will admit, I'm never in a hurry to come back and tend to get lost in big cities causing me to come home back late. When I saw what else was out there in my dreary life back home. I wanted to do everything I could to move out of this big city life and wanted to live how I wanted. Little did I know, my motivation would skyrocket one night. I had finished my work off early for the day because my friend Mason and I were planning to head to the plains outside of the field and test out the new rifle. Sounds very hillbilly, I know, but in a town like this, you had very little as entertainment. Mason had been my best friend and my neighbor for my entire life, while well, neighbors were being about half a mile apart. We were born a week apart, and we held a strong kinship like brothers. We did everything together. To cap off my day, I always logged the amount of grain harvested that day and placed the silos at the end of the farm. Most people don't realize there's actually a lot of paperwork involved in farming wheat. While I was deep into the paperwork, I began hearing a very low tone rumble in the distance. This wasn't concerning. At first, another popular form of entertainment with the folks of riding dirt bikes. I shrugged it off and hastily continued my work to leave before it got dark, but dusk was ending fast. I threw down my initial to finalize the last of the forms. I was able to lift my head out of the work. The rumbling sound continued, and it was louder before. At this point, I knew this wasn't the sound of dirt bikes. It was strange, almost screechy noise coming from outside. I threw on a sweatshirt and walked outside while I had to identify the noise I was hearing. As I walked outside, I felt some sort of charge, the best way I can explain it. My arm hair stood on the end as the very light wave of what felt like static electricity wafted through me. It wasn't painful at all, but noticeable. The screeching continued, and it was... Only when I walked outside, I realized it wasn't coming from the north, south, east, or west. It was coming from a black, empty void in the sky. It became once of the sunset. At this point, the screeching almost had an inflection of howling as it would kick up and die down within a matter of seconds. The closest I can compare the sound is someone dragging a chair across a hardwood floor, except amplified a hundred times over. Was this an echo from the factory of the edge of town? Did one of the neighboring farms purchase a new machine that was malfunctioning? I knew none of this could be right because the sounds that were coming from directly above me. We had no mountains to echo sound and we were surrounded by nothing but horizon yet. It reverberated everywhere around me. At this point, I wasn't the only one to notice. Much to my relief, I could see porch lights coming on in the distance. My neighbors across the way as I watched them slowly come out of their house and figure out the same mystery I was perplexed by. A few seconds later, I heard my back screen door behind me. My parents had awakened from the sound and came to investigate as well. What the hell is that sound? My dad said in his traditional Midwestern accent. I don't know, Dad. It just started up about a minute ago, 
I thought it was the Thompsons playing around in their bikes again, but it's coming from the sky. I replied, damn idiots crop dusting this time at night. I'm going to bring this up in the next town meeting, he snapped at me, clearly frustrated by the sudden awakened state. This ain't no crop duster, Henry, my mom chimed in. It sounded like one of those underwater documentaries. I like where the whales talk to each other, except it doesn't sound right. It was at this point my dad fell quiet and stared at the ground. I couldn't tell if he was really trying to figure out what was happening or if he was simply irritated by my mom's description of sky whales. Do you think we should call someone? I said, breaking in awkwardness as the screeching of the sky continued. My mom looked at my dad for his response. Nothing. He continued to stare at the same spot of the ground. His face was emotionless. I began to realize something wasn't right. I approached my dad and grabbed his shoulder. Uh, Dad, are you okay? I asked with one eyebrow raised. As soon as he felt my hand on his shoulder, he jerked his shoulder away and began yelling. No words, just yelling as if he was terrified beyond reason. His eyes were wider than I'd ever seen and he fell to the ground with his hands straining in front of his face. He was straining so hard, every vein in his hands, arms, and neck were popping out. I leapt at him, trying to hold him and calm him down. Dad! Dad! What's going on? What's happening? I yelled frantically. I looked bad at my mom, who was in a state of shock watching the situation unfold, holding her hand over her mouth. His screaming continued as he took one swipe towards the ground, digging all five fingers into the dirt, and he was trying so hard to get himself back up. Mom, call the ambulance, I yelled, restraining my dad. Without a word, my mom ran into the house, eyes still wide open. My dad made it to his knees, still screaming in terror as the sky above continued its bellow. His hands still stretched in front of him, strained, as if he couldn't possibly close them. His eyes wide open, slowly moved towards mine. He stared at me, mouth wide open. His eyes were blood red at this point. That's when I noticed my father begin tearing at the flesh of his own face. I tried to stop him, but being twice my size, I wasn't able to come out muscling him. Gushes of blood poured down his neck as he continued tearing at his own face. He dug so deep I could see muscle and cheekbone. I never will forget how he continued to stare at me as he tore his own face apart. I didn't know what to do. I ran into my mom, who was on the phone. It's just a busy signal, she yelled in frustration. Mom, Dad is going insane or something. He's scratching his own face. I, I don't know what to do, I shouted frantically. We both ran back outside to see my father laying on the face first in the dirt. His screaming had stopped. He was breathing heavily, but seemed to be unconscious. My mom and I looked at each other in disbelief. I walked over slowly. I decided I needed to get him into the house and tie him down before he woke back up. Hopefully by then we can get an ambulance here to help. But the damage was done. I grabbed his arm to turn him over. That's when he leapt at me, knocking me on the ground. He climbed on top of me and began screaming uncontrollably again, with blood and flesh dripping down on my face. I began screaming as well. Out of desperation, my mom grabbed a brick from the unfinished patio my dad was building. She hit him in the back of the head as hard as she could. My dad fell on top of me, unconscious. The sky continued its screeching. I pushed my dad off of me and I looked up at my mom, who was in a state of shock of what she had just witnessed. She fell onto her butt without changing her expression. Mom, we have to get to Mason's house and get help, I said trembling. She didn't move. I knew I had to take control despite my extreme terror I was feeling inside. I picked my mom up off the ground and we started to walk to our friend's house. The shrieking sky continued as we slowly walked. The sound faded in and out. As I soon thought the sound might have ended after the last wave, it continued again. My mom didn't say a word of the entire walk. It was then that I noticed the static feeling had not gone away. My hair was still on end. We finally arrived at Mason's house. My tunnel vision had finally let up during the walk due to the fright of what happened. I pounded on the door yelling Mason's name. No answer. It was then that I looked across the street and saw his closest neighbor at the window of the house. He was calmly writing and writing and writing. I looked closer at what he was writing on the window. It was gibberish, non discernible words. As I looked closer, I noticed the same writings were on the walls in the room he was. 
He had been writing this for several minutes. What was happening? Is everyone going insane? Is this roar in the sky turning everyone into a mental case? I began knocking harder. Mason finally answered. He grabbed me immediately and hugged me. Travis, you have to help me, he said with his face buried in my shoulder. What's happening, I replied, to admit I have came for his help. My mom has stuffed herself in the linen closet and rocking back and forth talking to herself. She's completely gone. I don't know what to do, he said timidly with tears in his eyes. His father died when he was three years old in a motorcycle accident, so he had to be the man of the house his whole life. Right now, though, he was in complete loss of what happened to his mother. He led us to the closet, which was closed. The mother was starting to come out as her canic state realized what was happening. I knocked on the door. No answer, just a low voice. She was still talking to herself. The Stanvers? It's Travis and Mason. Can we help? I asked as nicely and politely as I could. She continued talking, not to us. I put my ear to the door and I could hear what she was saying. Why did you let me buy this stuff, Trent? Why did you leave me? I don't deserve this. You're selfish. You left me. You left me. It's your fault. You left me. Why did you buy that death trap? She continued. I think she's talking about your dad. I said to Mason as he stood at the door. I continued. It's like she's gone in some kind of psychosis. I tried to open the door, but Mason stopped me. No! I tried to get her out of there. Every time I opened it, she screamed really loud. He snapped as he grabbed my wrists. A loud bang erupted from outside before we could finish the sentence. We looked at each other and ran outside to see what happened. A car had slammed into the front yard tree. Holy shit! Mason yelled as we ran to the car for help. My mom stayed behind, continuing to try to break through Mason's mom. We ran to the car to try to help whoever was in the accident. Before we got there, a man kicked his door open and began firing a shotgun into the air. Get away from me! I don't know who you are! He yelled, firing in all directions frantically. The noise in the sky seemed louder than ever. Mason and I ran into the house, locking our door behind us. That's when the man noticed he was there. He ran up to the door and tried to get in, slamming his shoulder into the door. I was able to deadbolt the door in time and ran into my mom. A blast came through the door. He shot the damn doorknob. He continued with two more shots, creating a larger hole in the door. The shooting stopped. I could hear him reloading the shells. After a few seconds, he began kicking the rest of the fragile door to make room to enter. I began grabbing my mom as we took her to the back door and ran out. I saw Mason walking down the hallway from his bedroom. I didn't notice he left. At this point, the man was halfway through the door with the shotgun pointed at us. Boom! I closed my eyes tight, covering my mom. All I could hear now was the terrible screech from the black sky outside. Other than that, it was eerie quiet. I opened my eyes. Mason was standing beside me with a new rifle aimed at the front door. I nervously looked towards the door. The man with the shotgun was hanging through the door with blood dripping down his neck. Mason got to test his new rifle after all. He slowly lowered the rifle and appeared to be in complete shock. He was going to kill us all, Mason, I said, attempting to console him with what he just did. He didn't respond to my statement. He just simply said, we have to get out of here an almost whispered tone. I nodded and grabbed my mom's hand to lead us out. Let's get back home and grab the car keys. They're on the kitchen counter, my mom yelled at me as we exited the back door. Right now, I was just glad to hear my mom speak. We ran to the house as quickly as possible. The sky seemed to be darker than ever. The roaring of the night continued. Mason and his mom waited by the car while I ran to grab the keys. They were right where she said. I grabbed them and began to head outside. I heard pounding on the window behind me. It startled me as I turned around quickly. My dad was in the window. He had torn up his, most of his face. I could see the roots of his teeth beyond his lip. I gasped as I stumbled back. I ran outside to the driveway. Get in, get in! I yelled as I unlocked the car door. They did as I asked and I rushed to the now unlocked car, not knowing what my new panic state had came from. They realized why quickly. I heard my mom scream loudly from the back seat. I looked up. My father was coming after us, dripping with blood, with chunks of flesh falling on the ground. I turned on the car and looked backwards out. I 
car wasn't moving. I yelled in frustration as my father hurled himself at the car window. Both Mason and my mom yelled this time. Shit! I yelled and realized I put the car neutral. Slamming the gear shift into reverse, I began backing up as the tires squealed. The sound of the sky actually masked the squealing of the tires. It continued its echoing roar. My dad tried to hang on to the car but fell off the ground. As we backed up out of the driveway, he continued tearing at himself as we drove off in the other direction to the big city. It was very soon after we started driving that we realized what happened to gravity. Entering a more residential part of town, we had to swerve over and over to avoid people who were wandering the streets. Many seemed lost, but we weren't yelling in nothing in particular. We passed by a naked woman in the street who was spinning in circles looking up at the noisy sky. Merely, there were several people who didn't seem affected by what this was. They were running around yelling for help. We couldn't stop to help them. We had to keep moving. No one in the car argued with that. As we approached the city limits, a man darted out of the road, arms stretched out on either side yelling for help. He slammed his hands on the hood as I screeched to a halt. He was terrified. As he started to walk around to the side of my car, a dark figure came out of nowhere and tackled him to the ground. I leaned forward, looking out of the window. A shadowy man repeated stabbed the frightened man in the neck. I still remember the gurgling sounds to this day. What the fuck? I screamed involuntarily as I screeched off. I heard a clunk under the car. I looked back in the rearview mirror to see a haze of red from my taillights. I could see I smashed one of the psychotic man's legs. He continued stabbing away as if nothing happened. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I continued not realizing I was even speaking. My side had completely tunnel vision on the fright at this point, making it difficult to focus on the road. We began cruising. Things started to calm down. No one was talking, though. The sound. That sound. From the sky, it began to fade away. I felt a sense of relief as the tingly, static feeling began to fade away, almost simultaneously. Mason let out a sigh of relief. No one spoke until we got into town. The city was peaceful. People were walking along the sidewalk without a care, dining in restaurants, walking their dogs, hanging outside the bar. Nothing had happened here. Should we go to the police? Mason said, breaking the silence. They have to be aware of what's going on. I replied quickly, but unsure. No. Stop at the closest motel. My mom yelled from the back seat. We have a gun. If whatever happened back there reaches here, we need to be bunkered down and ready for it not surrounded by people. I couldn't come up with a more mental fortitude to argue or point. I stopped at the closest motel. It was dingy, but from where I came from, I wasn't bothered. Mom hurried to speak to the desk clerk and paid for a room. For safety, she made sure we were on the second floor. None of us slept. We turned on the TV and tried to get any information we could for what was going on. To our shock, nothing. No breaking news reports, no emergency broadcast, not even a mention of the screaming sky. What is this not being acknowledged? Morning broke as the longest night of my life ended. The city was still normal. After a few minutes of us three deliberating whether not to go back into town, we agreed at least to stay one more night and head back in the morning. That day, there were very little words said. We barely ate. I tried to call home around noon, but no answer. Mason tried his mom's cell. No answer. Another sleepless night came and went. When morning hit, we jumped in the car and took off home. The conversation in the car was a lot more heavy this time. We went back and forth trying to wrap our heads around what happened. What was that sound in the sky? Why was everyone going mad? Why was there no mention of this in the neighboring cities? As we headed or in the suburban area, we noticed a serene ambience. Birds were chirping, dogs barked in the distance, but no sound was coming from the sky. It was eerily quiet. As we drove, a younger woman walked out of the house, jogging off it in headphones. She began to run in place. She locked her door, turning, and began jogging. This was the same street I witnessed a violent murder. She was just going for a jog? As we continued, people were going out of their own business, like a big city, buying groceries, hanging out at coffee shops, and smiling as if their life was great. A chill ran up my sign as we pulled into our neighborhood. Fright came over me as I heard a roaring in the distance. This time, 
It was definitely the dirt bikes. We pulled into our driveway slowly. As we got out, we surveyed the area. No blood, no body. My dad was gone. We searched the entire house, no evidence of anything happening. We walked over to Mason's house. The front door was fixed. That or replaced, I don't know. We entered the house and the smell of bacon and named it the body of the kitchen. Where the hell have you been, boy? Mason's mom yelled as she flipped a pancake on the stove. Mom, are you okay? What happened? Mason said sheepishly. I was so pissed off that you didn't come home last night. If you were to stay at Travis's, you can at least let me know, she reported in a stern voice. My mom and I left back to our house. I looked across the street as Mason's neighbor. No writing. It was in permanent marker yet. There's no sign of writing, not even faded markings. We got home and phoned the police. They arrived and we told them the whole story. They acted as if we went crazy, even going as far as blaming it on the whole localized hysteria around the three of us. I knew what had happened and it was real. The only thing we could do was report my father missing. Since then, there has been no trace of him. I moved out three weeks later. Mason and I were able to get a job in the city, working at a warehouse. It's not much better than the wheat farm, but at least it does something. We've been currently roommating and we barely bring up what happened three months ago. My mom decided to stay and help out with the savings she had. Hired farmhands to help out. She decided to start her retirement early. It took me a long time to come to terms with what happened. The loss of my father will forever haunt me. The sights I saw were still my dreams. Sometimes I hear the sound that made me think of that night in the beginning. Would it happen again? Nobody in the small town said anything about it. Nobody in the city ever mentioned anything either. But all three of us vividly remember it. How could my father just disappear like that? Was this some kind of government test that went wrong? Dare I say, could it be aliens? Could this be just a natural phenomenon that never even been recorded? No matter how I try to piece what happened, nothing makes sense. Why was the sky screaming that night?